On today's show, the Houston Rockets get the win on the road against the LA Clippers B team, giving them a 500 record 41 and 41. But was it a successful season for the Houston Rockets? And what are the biggest questions as we head into the off season? We're going to tackle that all on today's Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control Houston. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, Native Houstonian, a credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcast, including... YouTube, where the best way you can help the show out is to comment your thoughts below. How did you feel about the close to the Houston Rockets season? How did you feel about the season in totality? Was it a successful season in your eyes for the Houston Rockets? I'm going to tackle that a little bit later in today's show, as well as the biggest questions navigating into the Rockets offseason. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. Look, I'll admit it. I have a bit of a competitive side. Most of us do. And my competitive side loves Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on a classic Monopoly. Join your friends and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play Store. And as always, thank you so much for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day. Whether it's on your way to work, on your lunch break, in the gym, thank you for being an everydayer and making the show part of your day every single day. The Rockets get the 116-105 win against the Clippers B team. No Kawhi Leonard, no Paul George, no James Harden, no Russell Westbrook. And the Clippers still managed to make it interesting at various points of the game. Didn't look like a guaranteed like walk-in-the-park dub for the Rockets, but nonetheless, they did get the win, and that gives them a 500 record for the first time in years. The first season that is not a losing season since the rebuild started. And they finish 41-41, and 41, a 500 record. Uh, that is a 19 win improvement from last season from 22 wins to 41 wins and the most wins ever for an 11th seed in NBA history. These are some of the factoids that we're going to revisit when we decide whether or not this season was a successful season for the Rockets. Spoiler alert, I think it was a massively successful season, but we're going to tackle some of the uh, macro and micro reasons for why this season was a huge success for the Rockets. We're going to get there uh, a little bit later on in today's show, but we're going to talk a little bit about this game, the final game of the season against the Clippers. And just from the jump, uh, a little bit of a disappointing performance from Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr., although that kind of matches some of the the performances prior to this game. It kind of feels like the wind was taken out of the Rockets' sails when it became apparent that the play-in tournament was no longer a possibility. And that's understandable, right? That's human nature. You're not competing for or playing for anything anymore. So that's it's only natural that you're not going to be at 100% or not giving your all the same way you were when a lot was still on the line before that, that faded loss to the Warriors. And then again, that really... A uh, gut-wrenching overtime loss against the Mavericks on the road following that one. A pair of really brutal back-to-back losses that I think kind of... I think the Rocket season kind of ended there a little bit, to be completely honest. But guys who did not disappoint in this game, Amin Thompson and Cam Whitmore putting a pair of exclamation points on the end of two fantastic rookie seasons. Cam Whitmore led the way, led the scoring for the Houston Rockets, 21 points. He also had six rebounds and five assists on nine of 17 shooting. And then Amin Thompson notching his first career triple-double, the first of many likely career triple-doubles for Amin Thompson. He had 18 points, 11 rebounds, 10 assists on eight of nine shooting. Those two guys led the way for the Rockets in this game again. Jalen Green only played 23 minutes in this one. Uh, Jabari Smith Jr. only 33. Amin had 40 minutes played. Cam Whitmore 36. So those were two, the clearly the two focal points for the Rockets in this game. And uh, Jabari Smith Jr., despite his shooting struggles, uh, 6 of 19 overall, 2 of 10 from long distance. He did hit a three-pointer late in the game to give the Rockets a little bit more separation as the Clippers were trying to make a push for it late, trying to make things interesting. And that three-pointer coincidentally that Jabari hit to give the Rockets a little bit of breathing room. 
uh, was actually Amin Thompson's 10th assist of the night. And Jabari kind of even pointed at Amin as if, you know, kind of acknowledging like, hey, I, I knew you needed a three. I knew or I knew you needed a, an assist to get your triple double. And the Rockets were so ecstatic about Amin's triple double after the game, you know, during his post game interview with uh, Vanessa Richardson. Alper and Shingun came over and and was yelling triple double twin and Jeff Green came over and and congratulated him as well just good vibes all around and for a team that had just 22 wins last season to finish the year with 41 wins to finish the year as a 500 team you know it's got to feel great for all the guys that were a part of this team last season and and for the past couple years right who had been here since the start of the rebuild, it's got to be a, a very gratifying sense, you know, of emotion to, to be able to walk away with your head held high. That even though they missed the play-in tournament by just a little bit, that this season still felt like a raging success. Uh, Amin, his triple double performance, nothing that we haven't seen before. The facilitating was kind of next level. Some really great. Uh, playmaking from him in this game. The offensive rebounding, we know that's something that he's been able to do. He was a beast on the offensive glass in this game. Five offensive rebounds against the Clippers. And then Cam Whitmore. We know that Cam's a bucket. We know that he can score with the best of them. Uh, and in flashes, for sure, he can he can get hot in a hurry. But the facilitating, the assists in this game, and the assists over the course of the last three or four games for Cam Whitmore, surprisingly, after you know his career high had been two assists uh, to walk away with multiple games where he had multiple assists in each of the games to close out the season was a welcome sight because we know that with Cam, it's the issue isn't ever going to be about whether or not he can score the basketball. We know that he can do that. The issue with Cam was at times throughout his rookie season, right? The tunnel vision or the poor decision-making both on offense and on defense. And to, so to see him kind of have a few games to round out the season where he was actively engaged in looking for his teammates, looking to make the right play, understanding that when he's facilitating for his teammates, it opens up his game, right? Because instead of defenses having to worry about him being, you know, a one-dimensional, just a bucket getter, a guy that's only looking to score the ball, now teams are going to have to question and worry, okay, can he get his teammates involved, right? And I think he's realizing that as he gets other guys involved, it makes his life easier on offense as well. But the guy who potentially stole the show for the Rockets in the fourth quarter of this game against the Clippers, Boban Marjanovic, who got his run to close out the season, played the final quarter against the Clippers, and he made the most of his minutes. 13 points, 8 rebounds in just 12 minutes played. And it's always fun to watch Boban go out there and hoop, especially you know in a game like this where the stakes are incredibly low. You can argue that the stakes were a little bit higher for the Rockets who wanted to finish this season with a 500 record just for, you know, bragging rights, for pride reasons, whatever, to be able to point to the season and call it successful. And I'm glad that they did, don't get me wrong, but Boban was definitely out there having having some fun with the Clippers. They had no answer for him. Very few teams do when you go out there and you actually play through Boban. Uh, Mason Plumley couldn't do anything. Daniel Tice couldn't do anything. And it was it was the Boban show. It was Showtime Boban in the fourth quarter. Uh, but probably the best moment from this game, aside from Amin Thompson notching a triple double, that was awesome. And Cam had some great dunks and some some there were some highlight plays between the two of those guys. Absolutely, yes. But probably the best, most fun moment from this game was when Boban got sent to the free throw line late in the game, and. He missed his first free throw, and I cannot attest to whether or not the first miss was intentional. I don't know if it was. I don't. I genuinely don't think it was. But after the first miss, and with the way that the crowd was reacting when there's free stuff on the line, two missed free throws meant free chicken for the crowd, uh, for the Clippers crowd. And Boban kind of was l- looking around and kind of acknowledged that the crowd was cheering for him to miss, walked back up to the free throw line, Missed it wide left, like completely bricked the free throw, and then pointed up and acknowledged the fans. Boban, a man of the people, giving the fans free chicken. I mean, what a better way to to close things out. And it's not like the it's not like Boban endangered the Rockets' chances of winning this game. Like they were winning pretty handedly by the time he had the chance to miss that free throw intentionally to give the Clippers fans some free chicken. So just a very wholesome moment from Boban for a very wholesome individual. Uh, 
And that does it, man. That's the end of the rocket season. But was it a successful season? That's the question we're going to tackle here in just a moment. Spoiler alert, I think it was, but I have a lot of evidence to back up why it was a successful season for the Houston Rockets. And then we're also going to take a look at some of the biggest questions as we start navigating the Houston Rockets offseason. We're going to get there in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch with killer last minute deals, all in prices, and views from your seat and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. And it's not just MLB tickets, Game Time has tickets for every kind of event in your area. It could be a sporting event. It could be a concert. It could be a theater event. Whatever you're looking for, Game Time has you covered. And again, my favorite thing about Game Time is they're all in prices. I hate when I go to buy tickets to an event and at the very end they like price gouge you with all of the you know hidden fees and the like you know digital handling fees and service charges and all that stuff. You wind up paying more in fees than you do for the actual tickets. Hate that stuff. You don't get that with game time. They give you their all-in price guarantee, plus they're obsessed with saving you money on tickets with so many different deals that you want to take advantage of. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off of your first purchase. Again, terms apply. Create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNBA. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Download the game time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Today's episode is also brought to you by Monopoly Go. Look, I've been told that I'm a competitive person, and most of us do have a competitive side, and my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure that you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on the classic Monopoly, where you play not on just one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messy with your friends. You can charge them rent on iconic properties, just like Classic Monopoly, but now you can also rob their vaults of riches for yourself, and the leaderboards show you who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is, so you get ultimate bragging rights with your friends. But it's not just the competitive side that loves it. You can team up with your friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get the game that you and your friends are going to love. Download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play Store. Again, download Monopoly Go, free on the App Store or Google Play Store. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. So the million dollar question, Was it a successful season for the Houston Rockets? I could just say yes, and then we just call it a day and move on. But that's no fun. So let's actually tackle like this in depth a little bit. Was this a successful season for the Houston Rockets? I think it was a massive success. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But let's let's start and let's rewind the tape a little bit. Let's go back to when Ime Odoka was hired, right? What was the expectation when Ime Odoka was hired? Ime Odoka's expectations were to take this team back to relevancy, to bring respect back to a Houston Rockets organization that had been the laughingstock of the NBA for a few years throughout the Silas era and throughout the Rockets rebuild. And I think we can safely say the Rockets have achieved that. They are now a respectable organization. They have had some huge wins this season. They have fought hard against basically every team that they played. There were only a handful of occasions that the Rockets went out there and had like a catastrophic game where they just got manhandled by an opposing team. I could probably count on one hand the number of times that the Rockets just got like royally blown out this season. And even in some of the games where the Rockets were just completely outclassed, they still fought hard. There were very few games where the Rockets weren't absolutely in a game or had a chance to win a game throughout this 82-game season. That is the sign of a good, competitive, respectable basketball organization. A team that went out there and fought hard every single night and gave themselves a chance every single night, largely in part due to their defense. And that, to me, is one of the most important takeaways from this Rocket season is Ime Odoka preaches defense. He is a defensive-minded head coach, and the Rockets, for the majority of this season, were a top defense uh, in the NBA, they they were a top five defense for a big chunk of the NBA season, and they finished the season as the NBA's 10th 
best defense, even after some of the defensive slippage over the last month, month and a half of the season, and basically ever since Alper and Shingun went down due to injury, the Rockets' defense had slipped a little bit. And I think that when we go back and look at some of our preseason predictions and expectations for this team, I argued this. Our co-hosts, Ben DuBose, Ali Kambijani, Madison Moore, a lot of us argued that the Rockets could and would be a top 10 defense this season. And they achieved that. It just They held on just barely there at the end. But becoming a top 10 defense after being one of the worst defenses in the entire NBA for the last few years, turning things around, becoming the best fast break defense in the NBA and cleaning up that area, cutting down on turnovers. Ime Odoka really did. He came in and he cleaned things up considerably and he didn't do it all by himself. Yes, the coaching staff deserves a metric ton of credit for taking this team from a 22-win team to a 41-win team. But it was also the marquee acquisitions that the Rockets had. And you'll, you'll see and hear other fan bases are like, oh my God, the Rockets paid all that money to Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks just to miss the playoffs. Don't listen to that crap, okay? First off, the Rockets had to spend that money somewhere because there is such a thing as an NBA salary floor. So they needed to spend money. And they went out and they got two of the best, most complimentary veteran role players and pieces that I think you could have gotten to achieve what the Rockets achieved this year, to set the tone, to help instill a culture with Ime Odoka. That's exactly what Fred and Dylan did. And then they themselves went above and beyond expectations, I think, with their actual on-court contributions. I think Fred was an absolute slam dunk of a signing, and you look back at his year, and when we go and tackle Fred's kind of season review and look at how he did in his first year with the Rockets, we're going to be just absolutely blown away by how impressive he really was looking back on everything that he accomplished with this team, both on and off the court. And then for Dylan Brooks, even though Dylan hit a bit of a rut here to kind of close out the season, the last, you know, month and a half or so has been, you know, not as great as the first stretch of the season was both those guys exceeded expectations and they delivered on what the Rockets needed them to do, which was to come in and be stabilizing forces for the young guys. And then you have to go even further and highlight the fact that Jeff Green and Aaron Holiday both played significant roles on this team. These weren't guys that were brought in to be heavyweight contributors on this roster. Aaron Holiday was going to be like your third string, in, you know, injury insurance guard. And Jeff Green was likely supposed to play like spot minutes here and there as like a four slash five stretch big man option. And unfortunately, Jock Landale just wasn't ready to go. The the lingering issues from the ankle injury and just didn't look like he was, you know, himself to start the season. So Jeff Green became your backup five. And then Aaron Holiday, six games into the season, immediately inserted into the into the immediate rotation after Amin Thompson's early injury. And both of those guys absolutely excelled in their roles and helped the Rockets achieve what they achieved this season. So the Rockets had a blueprint for success. They 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 went out, they upgraded their coaching, they brought in a coach to bring some respectability some accountability to this organization to provide an identity and a structure. And Ime Udoka absolutely achieved that. This team became a defensive-minded team, a defensive-minded organization. They finished as a top 10 defense. The veterans helped kind of cultivate that growth and grow this identity and hold the young guys accountable. And then the young guys, the biggest part of this equation, every single one of the Rockets' young core six got better this season. Alper and Shingun played like a borderline all-star, not even borderline. He played like an all-star and there's an argument that he probably could have made, not could have, should have made an all-star team. If he was in the Eastern conference, I think Alperin Shingun's an all-star. It's that simple. So Al P played like an all-star and was the anchor of a top 10 defense. That was the biggest question mark on Alperin Shingun was, can he be a part of an effective NBA defense? And he was playing at an all-star level in just his third NBA season. Incredible year for Alper and Shingun. Then we go to Jalen Green, who arguably right one of the more disappointing elements of this Rocket season was Jalen's play through about two-thirds of the season, and then he managed to turn it around in such an incredible way to close things out. When myself and many others were ready to write this team off after Alpi's injury, Jalen Green tapped into something 
incredible and turned his season around and started playing basketball, started playing some of the best basketball that I've ever had the chance to witness, not just of his career, of anyone's career. He was probably the best player in the NBA for a significant stretch there in the month of March when the Rockets went on their tear. And yes, the disappointing close to the season, some of the losses, specifically that Utah Jazz game, it, it does leave a little bit of a bad taste in your mouth. I get that. But none of that should take away from the stretch that the Rockets had there in March. And yes, they played against some lesser opponents during that stretch. I'll give you that, absolutely. But they also had some impressive wins in there against the Cavs, against the Kings, and they fought hard. They like That was an impressive stretch of basketball. And arguably, the not arguably, easily the best stretch of Jalen Green's career. So having that, having that to build on, to go into the offseason, to feel confident about, I think now you have to give Jalen Green the benefit of the doubt. Because we saw something and that I think was different than any of his previous hot stretches or hot streaks that he'd had in his career up to that point. And he got better in every single other category on the floor, right? He got better as a rebounder, got better as a playmaker, and as a, as a you know, as a primary facilitator, primary ball handler, got significantly better as a defender. He grew in every area of his game. And then we saw what it looked like, how he could look like a future superstar when he puts it all together with the scoring, dealt with double teams constantly. So yeah, Jalen Green absolutely improved this season. Tari Eason, uh, unfortunately with the injury bug, you know, hasn't played since January 1st. Uh, Tari just looked like Tari when he played, right? And Tari was... Super impactful when he played. One of the Rockets' best defensive defensive pieces. Uh, you know, just makes things happen on the basketball floor. It, it looked a little bit like he had cleaned up some of the finishing around the rim, too, this year, which was really nice to see. So, you know, not as much data on Tari, unfortunately, for this year. But he looked better. Looked more comfortable in year two and looked great in Ime Odoka's system. You know, thriving under a defensive-minded head coach. Jabari looks a lot better in year two. You know, it was a rough year one for Jabari Smith Jr., but he improved his three-point shooting, he improved his defensive versatility and capabilities, and and we got a really great long look at Jabari as a starting center in in the NBA, and whether or not that's something that he could do full-time or, (coughs) pardon me, or at least situationally throughout, you know, certain points strategically in a game. So Jabari improved, and then... For Amin Thompson and Cam Whitmore, talked about them already in segment one, but to have the rookie seasons that they both had on a team that was playing winning basketball and striving and and, and pushing for the NBA play-in tournament to be impactful players as rookies, that doesn't happen. Hardly ever. Rookies are never impactful. Rookies never impact winning at that level. It was crazy when Tari Eason was doing it last year, and it's crazy now this year watching Amin Thompson do it. So... To have them and, and be able to bring them in, I think their development is probably going to jumpstart and be much further ahead than some of the other Rockets' young pieces because they came into a team that had structure, had an identity, had accountability, had all these things that you know guys like Jalen and Alpi were missing through their first couple of years. So I think their development's going to be kind of accelerated in that regard. But yeah, they got better. Amin Thompson is a completely different player than he was you know, to start the NBA season. And Cam Whitmore looks much more in control, smooth. You know, he was really raw when he came in. And now both of those guys look like legitimate, solid NBA rotation pieces with an immense amount of upside. So yeah, the Rockets missed the play-in tournament. They didn't make the playoffs. That's a bit disappointing. But even then, I think, you know, we were maybe spoiled by some of the early season success, which is why myself and many others were frustrated with, Jalen Green's level of play to start the year because it kind of felt like, man, you know, this this team is a Jalen Green leap away from being a legitimate playoff contender. And then we saw what happened when the leap happened with Jalen, but, you know, it happened a little bit too late because they couldn't make it coincide with Alper and Shingun and his incredible level of play. So the future is incredibly bright for this Rockets team when you look at what they achieved this year. And to give you a little taste of what the Rockets could be in store for next season, the OKC Thunder were 40 and 42 last year. And then they had a 17 win increase and went 57 and 25 this year and finished as the number one seed in the Western conference. I'm not saying that the Rockets are going to finish number one seed in the West next season, 
What I will say very confidently right here, right now, is barring significant injuries, the Rockets can run back this exact same core and finish top six in the West next year. Guaranteed. I will guarantee you that right now. You're listening to this podcast. If the Rockets don't have any significant injuries next year and they run back basically this exact same core of players, adding Steven Adams, getting back Alper and Shingoon, all the young guys growing and developing for another year, getting back Tari Eason into the mix, all those pieces, the Rockets are going to be a top six seed in the West, guaranteed next season. That much I feel confident about saying. But there are still a lot of questions for this Rockets team. Will they make any significant moves this offseason? What are they going to do surrounding the NBA draft? Because, hey, they've got another top pick coming in, courtesy of the Brooklyn Nets. We're going to tackle what some of the biggest questions are for the Houston Rockets in this final segment coming up in just one moment. First, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks is so simple to play. You can make your picks and submit an entry in less than 60 seconds. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of different players and stat types are what makes Prize Picks the number one DFS app on the market. And look, the NBA season might be over, but you can still get in on the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during the NBA postseason. So if you've been thinking about getting into daily fantasy sports, try prize picks. Download the app today and use code Locked On NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go grab the app today on Google Play Store or the App Store. And use promo code locked on NBA for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And final segment here at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. All right. So, as we are now wading into the waters of the NBA offseason, at least the offseason for the Houston Rockets, uh, what are some of the biggest questions? Facing this team. I want to know your thoughts. In addition to what I asked you earlier, your thoughts on the, the end of the season for the Rockets, what are the biggest questions facing this Rockets team this offseason? Because there are a lot of big questions, and we can kind of go in, I guess, we'll just go in order here. And first big question is, what are they going to do with the NBA draft? They've got the NBA draft lottery coming up in the middle of May. Uh, right now, the Brooklyn Nets pick that is owed to the Houston Rockets uh, is sitting at ninth in the NBA draft lottery. So it has a 20.3% chance of jumping into the top four of this year's NBA draft. Uh, and then the Rockets' own pick, which is currently owed to the OKC Thunder, is sitting at 12, uh, but could jump up to 11, depending on the outcome of the Hawks and Bulls play-in run, I believe. Uh, currently sitting at 12th, owed to OKC has a 7.1% chance to jump into the top four. And again, that percentage could jump up a little bit to 9.4%. And again, if that Rockets pick does jump into the top four, then they keep the pick because of the top four protections on it. But what are they going to do with those picks, right? Are they going to hold on to them and draft another young player? Is there a piece that is attractive enough in this year's NBA draft for the Rockets to take and either A, that they would feel confident in being an immediate impact contributor to next year's team, albeit in likely a smaller role, or would they draft somebody and kind of draft and stash and take somebody that they could, you know, slow play a little bit and bring along slowly and, you know, grow through the RGV system, Sim kind of similar to what they did with, Cam Whitmore this season a little bit, right? Where he wasn't with the team right away, spent some time with RGV and then, you know, worked on his game, refined some things and then joined the Rockets and was able to help, you know, in the latter half of the season. Maybe that's what they do with the pick or they could potentially trade it. And again, we're going to, you know, I have to preface by saying we're not going to answer all these questions in today's show. We'd be here for like 18 hours straight. It'd be the longest podcast in NBA history actually maybe in podcast history, but uh, which side note, look up the longest podcast that has ever been made because I'm very curious now. Uh, but I digress. Like, you know, should the Rockets trade the pick, right? Are they at a place where it makes more sense to use that asset if it is attractive, right? Maybe the Brooklyn Nets pick jumps into the top four and suddenly you could use that and maybe package it with, you know, one of the current young guys or a couple of the, the current role players, some expiring salary and make a, you know, make a push for 
any, you know, an immediate impact guy or upgrade one of your positions, right? Dylan Brooks played out of his mind for two thirds of the season, but the last one third or so, you know, he kind of regressed a little bit back to some of the, the tendencies and some of the play style and production of Memphis Dylan Brooks, unfortunately. And if the Rockets could find themselves a significant upgrade at that starting three spot for next season, then I think you'd have to at least consider it. But that's also the other thing is, should the Rockets just stand pat and do nothing and be willing to run it back next year and just see how things look? Or should they be actively looking at the trade market and seeing if they can find, you know, areas that they can improve this current roster and either, you know, marginal upgrades here and there, or should they take a gigantic swing? Should they trade for a star player? Maybe there's a, you know, a star player out there who shakes loose depending on how this NBA postseason plays out. Not, I'm going to say this and I'm going to put a massive grain of salt when I say this, but a couple names to maybe be on the lookout for that the Rockets might have some interest in. Kevin Durant and Paul George. Depending on how those two teams, the Suns and Clippers respectively, fare in the postseason, those are situations that could become untenable where if Paul George can't figure out a contract extension with the Clippers, maybe he wants out of L.A., Maybe he wants to go to a team that he can, you know, actually guarantee an extension with. And Paul George slotting in on this Rockets team would look really, really good at that three spot. Give them some much needed shooting, some defense, some veteran experience, leadership, all that stuff. And he doesn't have to be the alpha as long as you've got guys like Alper and Shingun and Jalen Green who are kind of growing into becoming the alphas themselves. Conversely, Kevin Durant, another big name, but a lot of mileage, much older player, I don't know, you know, it, it would it be the right move for this Rockets team to swing for a big name, especially if it costs you one or, or multiple of the young guys in the process. Is the young core six untouchable? That's another big question. Could the Rockets potentially lose Ben Sullivan to another team who would, you know, would potentially look at hiring him as a head coach? Maybe not right away, but Ben Sullivan is definitely one of the lead assistants in the NBA that would be and should be on track to be an NBA head coach one day. How good does the rest of the Rockets' young core become after a full offseason together? Keep in mind, yes, they had Ime Udoka last offseason, and yes, he was the Rockets' head coach and all this, but they hadn't played yet under Ime Udoka. Now these guys know what Ime wants. They know who he is as a coach. He knows who these guys are as human beings, as basketball players, as, pro as professionals. Now it's not speculative. Now it's not Ime Odoka sitting there looking at film from the Silas era or college tape or overtime elite tape trying to figure out what he has in these guys. He knows what he has in these guys. He knows what their strengths are. He knows what their weaknesses are. How much better do these guys get this offseason working on these things with a full offseason and a full year's worth of tape now under Ime Odoka's belt to figure out exactly how to improve this team? How good can this team be next year? Like, that's the exciting thing. As you look about, you, you start thinking about what this Rockets team can do this offseason. Are they going to be, are they going to be players in free agency? More than likely not. Um, they're probably going to operate as above the cap team. Do Jalen Green and Alper and Shingun get rookie extensions? How much do they get on their rookie extensions? Are they both, do you immediately max both of them? Do you potentially hold off? on maxing Alper and Shingun so that you have more available cap space to work with next off season. Because right now his cap hold, if you were to hold off on giving him a max deal, his cap hold would be a lot more insignificant and you'd have a lot more flexibility to do some fun things potentially in free agency, not this summer, but next summer. Jalen Green's cap holds a little bit different since his uh, dollar figure is a lot higher since he's the second overall pick instead of, uh, being middle of the pack like Alper and Shingun was. But those are significant questions, right? And how it impacts the, the future of the Houston Rockets' finances and their payroll. Do you feel confident enough in Jalen and Al P being your one-two punch, your, your, your alphas on this team that you're willing to give them both a significant payday right now when you still have to figure out down the line, does Jabari get a payday? Does Tari get a payday? What about a men and Cam? Those two guys still have star potential through the roof. You're not going to be able to pay everybody. 
So you have to be very careful about who you decide to pay right now and how much you decide to pay them right now. A lot of major questions facing this Houston Rockets team this offseason. I'm curious to know your thoughts. What are the biggest questions you have for this Rockets team this offseason? How do you feel about the conclusion of the season? Let me know all of that in the YouTube comments. In the coming days, weeks, months of the NBA offseason, we got a ton of content planned for you. You're going to be shifting gears, and we'll be looking at a lot of draft stuff in the coming weeks as we approach the NBA draft and figuring out whether or not the Rockets should keep that pick, trade the pick, who are some of the targets that make sense for this Rockets team. I'm going to be revisiting and breaking down all the play from individuals throughout this season, season review episodes, all that kind of stuff. So a ton of content coming your way. But as it's the conclusion of the NBA season, I do want to say thank you. Even though the content isn't stopping here at Locked on Rockets, we keep you covered and keep going all throughout the NBA offseason year round, as always. But I just want to say thank you, right? This is my fifth year, fourth year? Fifth year doing locked on rock five years. My God, sorry is it's been a it's been a minute. But uh, I love doing the show. I love doing the show for you guys. I love talking with you guys. I love interacting with Rockets fans. Um, being able to cover this team uh, is a dream come true, and it wouldn't happen without you guys, without the audience, without y'all's support. Um, you know, and I know there's there's various points you know throughout a season where. You know, maybe there's a, a, a really ugly loss or, a, you know, a missed episode or two, but I appreciate you for sticking with me throughout all of that. You know, sometimes real life can get in the way. Sometimes it can be as minor as tech issues or sometimes it's just it's a crappy game. And I don't want to talk about it any more than you want to listen to me talk about a crappy game. Sometimes that happens, too. But I appreciate you for being a listener, whether you're an everydayer and you catch every single episode or you're somebody who tunes in sporadically when something big happens with the team. I appreciate you. I appreciate you checking out the show and giving the show and me your support. And again, looking forward to a lot of exciting off-season content that we've got figured out and planned. Uh, Going to be trying to do some new things with the show here in the not-so-distant future. And very much looking forward to next season when this Rockets team is poised to take a significant step forward. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Just search Locked on Rockets, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, five-star review helps us out a ton. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Basketball.